1992, Manchester opened the Metrolink Light Railway. For all its microchip technology, the Metrolink is a direct descendant of the humble Victorian tram. In a world of polluted, gridlocked cities, the Metrolink saves over two million car journeys a year. The tram, it seems, is back. The tram car is primarily a very, very friendly thing. It'll never do anything nasty to you. Nobody has yet managed to put a tram car to an evil purpose. It has been all to the benefit of those who use it or those who had the pleasure of actually working with the things. And no matter how you mess them about, they still remain fairly rugged, simple, unreliable. While Manchester's new tram system cost £135 million, in 1879, the Isle of Man's horse-drawn bone shakers cost considerably less and ran all day on a bag of oats. These horse tram stables in the Isle of Man have been in use for over a century. They might seem quaint now, but by the 1890s, stables like these supported a growing network of trams across Britain. At last, people had what they wanted, the freedom of their cities. Trams have gone from most cities now, but the toy town world of Douglas, the Isle of Man's capital, is still ideally suited to one horsepower public transport. With giddy up to get going and a crude ratchet handbrake to stop, driving a horse tram was simple enough, if the horse was willing. There is a tremendous number of disadvantages with a horse tramway, namely the horses. All of their individual performances are quite distinct and separate from one to another. Quite a lot of them simply have a propensity not to work at all if they can avoid it. And the simple answer was to adopt some form of mechanical traction. You had steam tram locomotives. And there were various other attempts with battery locos and gas trams. And the one that really came into its own was the dear old electric tram car. Electricity brought the dawn of the modern age. Along with Blackpool, the Isle of Man pioneered electric trams in Britain. Looking like something out of Jules Verne, this mercury arc rectifier transforms the AC current we get in our homes to safer and more controllable DC, direct current, suitable to power the motors in a 10-ton tram. The Isle of Man's electrical substation was refitted in 1935 and has been in perfect working order ever since. The brasswork is kept gleaming by substation attendant Joe Cleeter, who tends to it daily, seemingly oblivious to the 550 volts pulsing under his brasso. Next station, the power is on now. The power comes off the overhead line at 550 volts DC and is picked up by the trolley pole and brought down into the cable in that's in the roof of the car. From there it comes down to the controllers here. Very, very simple things to drive our tram cars. You have the means to make it go and simply the means to make it stop. The uncomplicated nature of the electric tram ensured its popularity. With driving positions at both ends, trams were easy to operate. To change direction, the conductor swung the trolley pole round and the driver moved to the controller at the other end. Acceleration was a notch-by-notch -notch process. You have a total of nine power points altogether. Seven, eight, those resistance notches where you're cutting out more and more of the resistance and the car's picking up speed until you get to number nine or the top notch, hence the term top notch and that will bring you up to the maximum possible power speed the car will ever do. Car number one is still in top notch condition despite being the world's oldest working electric tram. 
Since 1893, it has run on the Manx Electric Railway, transporting locals and greeting some welcome arrivals. In the 1920s, a trip to the Isle of Man was like going abroad. The island was bursting at the seams with tourists. The trams, they were stretched from down to the bottom of Summer Hill from the Derby Castle and each car would come in, they were taking actually a, roughly a hundred people at a time. They were queued and queued and queued, you never thought you were ever going to get rid of them. Artie Wormsley worked as a conductor on these trams, but tourists weren't his only customers. This is, uh, I used to have to change the trolley this way, you see, right? You'd have to load the mail in with the postman that was there but on the top of that you had the school children to pick up, you had the milk, sometimes there was fish down at Kinney, and then you had of course your passengers as well. It was a freezing day, you had to stand at the back of the car with the trolley rope in your hand and keep hitting the trolley wires, but by doing that you kept breaking the ice all the time. Through snowstorm and heatwave, the survival of these trams is a tribute to their manufacturers, G.F. Milnes and Co but there's little that can go wrong on such a simple and cheap machine. Even when the depression hit in the 1930s, these hardy beasts provided welcome employment for the island's locals. If you had a job then, you thought you were the bee's knees. The pay, the pay was very, very poor indeed. Elevens, roughly elevens farther an hour. And that was the way my first wage packet, which was very hard to live on. 90-hour weeks and low pay obviously took the gloss off Artie's outdoor life, but the passengers he carried appreciated the effort. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. One return to Snaefeld, please. Evelyn Fraser has travelled on the trams since the 1920s. I used to go to Douglas on the Saturday with my mother and uh, they were always very clean, very well d disinfected, which made me feel quite queasy at times. The windows closed and I used to have to sit out with the driver. When we were children, we would go onto the track, put an ear to the pole, we would hear a noise and we would know that there was a tram on the way. We had wonderful station masters, so efficient, the one at Lexi wore a frock coat, a great big tall man. I can see him now coming out of the station amid crowds of holiday makers, thrusting his way through. In 1895, the Snaefell Mountain Tramway proved the power of electric transport 2,000 feet above sea level. When Snaefell Mountain Railway was planned, nobody actually knew for sure that an electric car would propel itself for one in 12 gradient by adhesion alone. Hence, the potential to put additional motors to drive wheels against the fell rail, the centre rail, which in the event were not necessary because an electric tram car would climb a one in nine if necessary without any additional help. It was clever. 